All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Seabird University 2024. Um, I'm Nicole Lucas, and I'll get you started with a little bit of housekeeping and then pass it off to Dane and Ryan to dive into their presentation. Um, so they'll be leading a presentation, and then the last chunk will be open for Q&A. Um, you can submit your questions through the Q&A box. If for some reason that's not working, you can you should be able to raise your hand and I can uh, message you and we can sort that out. But uh, submit your questions through Q&A and then at the end we will sort through them. Um, you can also use that if you're having issues with audio or anything, um, please let us know and we can do our best to get that sorted. Um, so with all of that said, I will pass it on to Dane and Ryan. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm Ryan. I'm uh, one of the developers here at uh, Seabird. Um, I've been working here for about two years. Uh, Dane, who's going to also be helping with this presentation, is also one of our core developers here that's been working on Fathom. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, and we can kind of get started here. Uh, just give me a second here. OK. So uh, I'm not sure how much of you, how many of you have actually downloaded and taken a look at Fathom. Uh, first of all, it's available through the Microsoft Store and the Apple Store. Uh, so you can just search for SBS Fathom uh, on those stores and you'll be able to download it through that. Um, it basically has, it, we're trying to roll in all the old applications into uh, one larger application. So uh, what used to be uh, previously in CSAVE and all the CSOF stuff, uh, UCI uh, is all now being combined into this new application that's Fathom. Um, here on the main screen, there's kind of three main sections. Uh, on the left, uh, we have this area that has some diagnostic information. The middle area is our connection panel where we can connect to all our various instruments. And the right is all our operations, all our kind of tools to interact with the instrument. So we're gonna go ahead and connect to one of the instruments. I'm gonna connect to a 19 plus. Um, that we currently have available. I know it's on uh, port 51, so I'm gonna hop down to that. At this point, you could select your baud rate if you know it. Uh, that might, uh, they'll speed up the connection process a little bit, uh, but it will also automatically detect uh, what baud rate the instrument is on. So this one, I don't really know what baud rate it's on, so I'm gonna leave it as uh, trying all of them. Uh, and now it's going to go through the connection process uh, of actually getting all the information from this instrument. And this just takes a second here. I'm going to actually cancel this for a second. It looks like we're having a little bit of an issue. Uh, this is one of our instruments actually not uh, here in person with me. It's uh, remotely on a different server at a, in our Bellevue office. Uh, so maybe our um, connection is getting messed up there. Just a second. Okay, uh, so it tried to connect to this instrument um, and it realized that it was already deployed. So it's trying to log some information. So I'm gonna hit this uh, stop deployment button uh, and then it's gonna go through the rest of the process of uh, getting the status of the instrument, uh, its current operation. Okay, and now we're connected. You can see that an image of the 19 plus showed up. 
Uh, if you're connected to a 37 or a 39, uh, an image of that will show up. You see on the left here, uh, we have uh, some information like the current firmware that's loaded on the instrument, all the calibration coefficients uh, that are on there. Um, and then a last section here, that's our deployment duration. And so that's uh, parameters like battery voltage, uh, how long the memory would last if you currently deployed it with its current settings, number of samples that are on the instrument, uh, so things like that. On the bottom, we have uh, other diagnostic information, the serial number, what mode it's currently in, it's in profile mode, and what baud rate it connected at. So now I'm going to walk us through a deployment. So let's say you want to take this 19 plus uh, and get it ready to be deployed out into the ocean. Um, you can go to this deployment tab here. That's going to open up this panel here that has a few different options. We're going to start from scratch. And so we're going to click this make new deployment button. I'm going to clear all settings. And we can put in some metadata information. So I'll put in my name, put in a comment. Uh, I'm going to select the pump type uh, that's installed on this instrument. And I know there's no external sensors right now. So I'm going to put there's a uh, zero amps draw for uh, the pump, uh, for the this auxiliary sensors. Um, these last two are not actually important for changing settings on the instrument, but they're used for uh, creating, um, to doing all the calculation for battery endurance uh, and memory endurance. Here on our second page is uh, all the main settings that we have for uh, configuring the 19 plus. If you're connected to a 37 or a different instrument, this would be a different set of uh, settings that would show up here. Uh, so this is specific to this instrument. Uh, and a lot of these inputs have uh, basically checks to make sure that you're putting in values that are correct. So if I put in uh, scans to average, if I put in a zero, that's not gonna be valid because uh, it knows that the 19 plus can only accept anything between one and 240 for that option. We'll put in, uh, let's do a scan, four scans to average. We'll leave it in profile mode. Uh, I'm gonna tell it to overwrite the data. Uh, and so it's gonna warn me that uh, if we go through with this, it's gonna overwrite the data that's currently on the instrument. Put in some other values here, just moving down the line. Um, and then here on the bottom is all our calculations based on the settings that I just put on, put up, put on in the top here, how long this instrument is going to last in the ocean, whether it's uh, the, how long it's going to take for the memory to fill up or how long it's going to take for the battery to drain. It's going to be a few files that are going to be output uh, through this process. I'm going to put them all in my downloads folder for now. We'll come back to these in a second. Um, and now I have one last chance to check that these are the settings that I want. So if I was actually getting this instrument ready for deployment, I would go through this list very carefully, make sure these are all the settings that I want. I'm gonna say I'm happy with this. And so I'm gonna click uh, the deploy button here. It's now communicating with the instrument, uh, sending all these settings. Um, it's not only sending those settings, but it's also getting verification back. So it's sending, if you are familiar with like the get CD command, it is pinging the instrument for that and getting a status back and making sure that those commands were actually accepted. Great, and so we got a little message here saying that the uh, deployment was successful. Um, this instrument you can now disconnect uh, and put into the ocean um, and you'd be ready to go. I'm gonna click confirm here. Let's go take a look at some of those files that were generated. Uh, it created two files here. We have one that's a deployment configuration and one that's a deployment report. The report file is basically all the settings that got put onto the instrument. Uh, it's just a JSON file, so it's human readable, but also readable by our computer. Um, if you want to ingest it into a script or something like that. Um, the deployment report also has all the status of the instrument. So all the different settings that were uh, put on it, uh, other things that are reported by the instrument's firmware. This configuration file uh, can be used to load in the deployment that we just did. So let's say you had five 19 pluses that you wanted to deploy. You go through the process we just did, it creates this configuration file. We can now take this configuration file and load it onto the next 19 plus. So it has the exact same settings. You're not sitting here clicking and all those things. So we'll do that for this one. I'm gonna click uh, this import deployment from file button. 
going to we'll go and load that configuration file. Uh, I already have a file this name this, so it's going to append a number to the end of this file name. And there, all those settings are uh, loaded in automatically, so we didn't have to go sit there and collect all, uh, click all those buttons. Uh, and I could click the deploy button here and it go through the process again. I'm going to skip it for now. Uh, let me exit out of here. So that's the deployment panel. Uh, there's a few other options here that I'm not going to go into, but they're similar to uh, that import deployment option. You can uh, edit all settings that are currently on the instrument. So let's say you have a 19 plus that's uh, completely configured. You just want to change one setting. You can click this edit button. And then the edit save deployment button uh, will load in that configuration file. But then you have the option of changing maybe it's just one parameter. Um, and so that covers the deployment. Um, we're now going to go take a look at the real time panel. Uh, this is basically the new version of what C save was. You would use this to, uh, if you were running a profile off of a ship, um, you could uh, go into this panel and collect data in real time. Uh, but it's also useful for other instruments that you might be not using for a profile. Let's say you have a 37 uh, in the lab and you just want to see if your sensors are giving you any kind of values. Maybe you put the sensor in a bucket of seawater and just trying to see if there's you know, some sanity check stuff. You can also use the real-time panel for that uh, to record some data in real time. Um, but before we do that, we need to configure this 19 plus um, for real-time data collection. So I'm going to go back to our deployment panel skip through some things. I'm going to check this button here that says deploy for real time. And that's going to force some settings. So that's going to force it to ignore the uh, switch. And it's going to also force the output format to be raw hex data. Uh, we put real scans, number of scans is four. <clears throat> and we'll deploy this again. So in this case, since I checked that button, it's not going to actually start the recording, uh, but it's going to configure the instrument for everything that I need for real-time data collection. OK. You can see, again, we got a message down here that the deployment was successful, but uh, your instrument has not been started. Please go to the real-time panel to start the data recording. So we can confirm and go out of here. And we'll now go up to the real-time panel. Um, at this point, uh, if I had auxiliary sensors, I could load in an XML con file. Uh, Dane's going to cover this a little bit in more depth, but an XML con file basically is a configuration file that has all the calibration coefficients for the instrument. Um, I'm going to skip that for now. Um, I can select different uh, units for each one of the sensors. Uh, so let's maybe do, uh, we'll also do the raw frequency uh, for temperature. Uh, we'll leave everything else the default. You can also have some derived parameters like salinity or depth selected. Uh, and now we're ready to start collecting some data. So I'm going to click the Start button. <clears throat> and that's going to kick off uh, our first cast. So this is going to, it's now telling the instrument to start recording data. And we see in real time uh, some of the data is starting to stream in. Um, this instrument is out in air, so obviously the data looks a little bit like garbage, uh, but you could start, you know, this would be normally, you'd be dropping the instrument through the water column uh, to collect some data. There's a bunch of controls on the plot. Um, and so you can select, the plot is very customizable. So you can um, select multiple different axes. So let's say, uh, let's put, um, Maybe we'll switch this to raw frequency. So you can change what's on different parameters, uh, different axes. You can uh, add second levels of axes. Uh, you can change uh, font sizes of uh, all the different elements. You can also change uh, the colors of different data series. There's a lot of customizability there. <clears throat> um, Let's bring this back up. This is a little small. I'm going to stop the data recording right now. Also on this plot, you can, it's very interactive. So you can zoom in on sections and get a more detailed view of your data. 
you can click this little auto scale button to get back to viewing everything. And the axes themselves, you can drag. So you can, let's say you want to align a temperature to conductivity or something like that, you can drag, click and drag them. And they're also scalable. If you click on the very right edge, you can scale it way down uh, and compress uh, the axis. One last thing before we lift, leave this page <clears throat> is we have this metadata section. Um, this is information that you would want to add to say a uh, scan or uh, your cast. So let's say you're at a station and you wanted to mark, add that into the data. You could call that, just type it into uh, this box here. And now that's associated with cast ID one. <clears throat> Similarly for each scan, you can also add information. Maybe you observed a fish here. And so you could write that in and say, now at cast ID and one and scan ID one, we saw a fish. Um, you can also uh, mark a scan. So let's say you're going down, you don't want to write a note, but you just want to mark it. You can click that button, uh, the scan marked uh, becomes checked, um, and that will then be in the data set. You can also go back and change things. So let's say you actually messed it up and you actually wanted to be on scan 65. You can go here and click that scan marked. You scroll back up to 68, and then it's clear. OK, so that's the data collection part of this. Um, now let's say maybe it's the end of the day uh, and you've done collecting all your data. You go to the next tab here and we can export all this data uh, onto our hard drive. Currently it's living within Fathom in a database, um, but if you wanted to export it into a hex file or a CSV file, uh, this would be where you can do that. And hit that confirm button. And now we have uh, individual files for each cast along with uh, an image of the plot. These files, uh, this, so this is data that's collected just from, that's recorded on the computer, but there's also a copy of that data on the instrument itself. And so if you wanted to uh, upload that data through uh, the data upload panel, which Dan's going to go through in a second, you could also do that. Um, so basically, you have two options for uh, retrieving your data after doing uh, a real-time cast. OK, I think uh, that covers it for now. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Dane. Dane's going to cover everything. Oh, wait, I do want to cover one, some more stuff in the terminal here. Um, the terminal is basically for uh, anyone that really knows all the commands. So let's say you know all the commands that are directly uh, pertain to the 19 plus and you want to configure it yourself. You don't want to go through the whole deployment panel because you're a power user. Uh, you can come here to this terminal page and uh, type in commands, uh, you know, like get CD or something like that and work with the instrument directly. Um, this is also a good way to uh, double check some of the work. You can go back. This has a complete log of everything we've done today. Uh, so if we scroll back far enough in here, let's see if we can see it. We'll see some of our uh, deployment settings going in. Yeah, so like this section here, you can see that some of the settings are starting to get changed uh, from the deployment panel. And so it's also a good way to go in there and check uh, to see that everything went in uh, as expected. OK, now I'm going to hand it off to Dane. And he's going to walk us through uh, the data upload part and the data processing parts of this. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, I will be going ahead and sharing my screen now uh, so we can go ahead and walk through all of those parts of the data. But hello, my name is Dane Lucas. I've been a software engineer here at uh, Seabird Scientific for about four and a half years now, uh, mostly working on this software that we're showing to you today, uh, and also a few other smaller projects along the way as well. Uh, but you should be going ahead and seeing my screen now. Now, I've connected to a 37SM. Uh, this is just a local one that I've got sitting here on our rack. Um, and I'm going to be showing what you can do if you want to be uploading your data uh, and you didn't collect it through real time. Maybe this is a 37 that you left out on a mooring for a number of months uh, and you've just recovered it and you want to get that data. Um, how are you going to do that? Well, the most simple way to do it is through the data tab here in the top right. 
and then you can save instrument data to your computer. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Now I can go ahead and select a few different options in here, like the transfer format. Um, binary is generally going to be faster, but ASCII generally works fine as well. Uh, this is a 37, so I can choose to make a XMLCon file uh, as a part of this if, if I want. Uh, I can also turn that one off. I'm going to go ahead and turn that one off right now. We're not going to need it. Uh, and I can talk about different ways you can make an XMLCon file or where they can come from as well in just a moment. Um, now I also can choose if I want to transfer all my data as a single file or if I want to choose a scan number range. Uh, let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, that'll open this small section here where I can choose the beginning scan number and the number of scans of transfer. I have 32 scans total on here, um, so I can't go above that. I can't say I want 60 scans um, because I there aren't 60 scans. Uh, so I'm going to leave it as that. I'm actually going to just upload all the data as a single file and just not worry about it too much. I can choose to add some header information in here. Uh, this can is a, a sort of like a prompt and value section. So like I can say day, Tuesday. I can type whatever I want in there. I can also go ahead and delete that. That's not a very insightful comment, uh, especially because the today's date is going to be captured in the upload file. Uh, so I could figure out it's a Tuesday if I wanted. But I am going to put some notes in here like this is a demo. Um, and then that'll show up in the output file. Uh, now I can go ahead and choose where I want to be saving my files to. Let's go ahead and choose a useful location. Downloads is fine, uh, but I've got this handy demo directory where I'm going to be saving files to, so you can look at them all a little bit later. And I can also choose the upload, change my file name if I want. I'm going to go ahead and leave it as the default. I'll go ahead and hit next, and it's going to run that upload. So you saw there's only 32 samples on it, so it's not going to be very long, fortunately. Uh, but if it's a longer uh, or it's a larger data set, then it's going to take a little bit of time, just sort of depending on what goes on with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, transfer and save were successful. Let's go ahead and look in here. Uh, and we can see that we saved a hex file, and we also saved an XML file. Uh, so these are two different representations of the data. We don't have to look at them just yet, particularly because the data is not too interesting, to be honest, uh, because this instrument's just sitting in air. Um, but uh, this or this hex file is what we're going to be loading into data processing, not this one again, uh, a more interesting one, uh, but that'll be a good way to get started with data processing. So let's go ahead and check it out. So we can go ahead and process and plot data. Uh, this is what we're going to do to actually, uh, well, convert from the raw values to our converted values. We're also going to be able to see it on a plot similar to how Ryan showed it in real time. And we're going to put, be able to apply a number of corrections to it as well. Uh, whatever we want to do to apply to our data. So let's go ahead and start by choosing our raw data file, which is a .hex. Uh, so let's go ahead and browse for a file. Uh, and we have the one that we just loaded in, which we could choose. Uh, I'm going to choose this demo file instead for SB19+, plus, uh, because that's going to be a bit more interesting. Uh, I'm also going to go ahead and load in an XML con that is used for it as well. Uh, so I've got a couple X XML cons in here. I'm going to choose this bottom one. Uh, the XML con, essentially, as sort of Ryan sort of mentioned, uh, it specifies the configuration of your instrument. And this includes a number of things. Uh, for all instruments, this is going to be including your calibration coefficients. We can generally get those from the hex file, um, but a lot of times they're more precise in the XML con. Um, and generally they're created more thoughtfully so to speak uh so we generally trust those more so in this case there's actually a discrepancy between the calibration coefficients in my hex and my xml con i know i want to trust the xml con in this case uh so we're going to go ahead and select that the other thing that's located in your xml con file that's pretty important to keep in mind uh this is specifically for the 19 plus v2 is any configurations about your auxiliary sensors whether they're serial or uh if they're voltage sensors, uh, that's going to be captured in your XML con, and we won't really be able to process those and convert those to the correct units without loading in an XML con. We can't do that just from the hex. We can see that there might be auxiliary sensors that we won't know what they are. We can go ahead and take a look at what that looks like in just a moment as well. Uh, so now we're here to the data conversion tab. This is step two of data processing, uh, where we get to tell the software what units we want to convert. So we can go ahead and open each of these expandable sections, and we can see, hey, here's my temperature units. I want ITS 90 degrees C, but I also want maybe degrees Fahrenheit as well. Why not? Um, I can go ahead and open conductivity, do the same. I can choose the raw frequency for this one. Um, and you can choose whichever units you want to be able to look at both in your plot as well as later on in the output file. This is what controls what goes into that file. Uh, you also notice at the top here, there's this little section with the slope and offset. If we go ahead and look at this tooltip on the right side here, 
that'll tell us that these are values we can edit in the configuration file. Uh, so we'll have to keep that in mind if we want something different. You might want to use these in case you're doing uh, like a post cruise calibration where you're adjusting the slope or the offset of uh, one of your data sets based off of what the results of those calibration tell you at the end of a cruise. Um, but by default, we'll want them all just as slope one, offset zero, which means we're doing no corrections to it. Uh, the slope is a multiplier and the offset is a uh, just a scalar that you would add to it. Um, uh, let's not worry about it uh, too much. We can go ahead and change our latitude and longitude if we want to. This would be useful for a salinity correction down the, down the Y. Uh, I don't actually know what the latitude and longitude were uh, where this instrument was deployed, so I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, and then we have the two auxiliary sensors that we identified on this SB19+, plus, uh, which would be a SB43 oxygen sensor as well as an SB18 pH sensor. So we can pop both of these sections open. Um, and we can go ahead and potentially add some more units for these as well. Uh, there's also two check boxes here at the bottom, which are for the 43 specifically, which are for applying tau correction and hysteresis correction for the data. Uh, these are two corrections that help deal with some sort of extreme cases uh, and just sort of make the data more standard. Uh, we can go ahead and leave them on. We can turn them off. Uh, it's really up to, up to the user uh, what they'd like to do with their data. And then the same thing for the uh, the SB18 pH sensor here, we can choose pH or the raw voltage, or just leave these at the defaults for now. I'm going to go ahead and hit next, and that's going to start the data conversion process, where it's actually going to run through and convert uh, our raw data into all of the data uh, output formats that we really specified in that previous panel. And there is our data. That's our temperature and our conductivity on the plot. Uh, we can see an upcast and a downcast here. Uh, and we can also go ahead and add some other things to the data. So if we pop open our axes dropdowns, we can see some of the other units. Uh, for example, we have our derived auction we can add to the plot. Very exciting. Uh, so we go ahead and click that, and that'll show up in the plot. That's our red color here. Um, and then if we can also go ahead and put our pH on there, um, because why not? We want to see all the data. OK, and there we go. And that's our purple color here. Very exciting. Uh, and Ryan sort of mentioned all of these different plot controls, but you have a lot of uh, customizability of what you want your plot to look like. So don't forget that you can play around with that as you'd like. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it too much for now. Let's go ahead and head to the next panel. Um, now we're here. Uh, in step four of data processing, where you can actually run data processing modules to apply some corrections to your data. Um, if you have used SBA data processing a lot, like I have, uh, these names might look a lot very familiar to you. And if you have it, then that's OK. We can sort of walk through uh, what some of them are and why you run them. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's up to you. Uh, so first, there's filter. This sort of is a low-pass filter to smooth out your data. Uh, so this can be useful just for applying smaller corrections to the data, just to smooth it out, as particularly when it's changing rapidly. Um, another option that we're actually going to run today is align CTD. Now, I've already put some values in here. This is actually saved from a previous run through. Uh, that's something that the software does in a lot of cases, where it'll save uh, your default settings from previous runs. Uh, and I've put some values in here for my temperature and conductivity offsets. And we're actually going to run that in just a moment. Uh, but this can be useful to align parameters uh, in time relative to pressure. Uh, and this is going to be particularly useful for our data set here, because if we look at it, uh, we'll notice that our upcast and our downcast are not exactly aligned up. Uh, and it'd be a lot better if they were. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, put some values into here. I'm going to try these two for now. So this is aligning temperature by 1.75 seconds. Uh, compared to pressure, and it's aligning conductivity by 1.25 seconds compared to pressure. Now, these are just values that I've played with uh, a little bit and sort of guessed and checked. But we can go ahead and just start from, uh, if we if we put zeros in here, we'll see exactly what we're seeing. So let's go ahead and put like one in for both of them and see what happens when we hit apply. When we hit apply, it's going to start from uh, the base converted data, and it's going to apply these offsets. And we could just see our temperature and conductivity did just shift a little bit, uh, and the upcast and downcast are looking look a little bit closer. Um, but I want them closer than that. So I'm going to go try maybe make like 1.75 for temperature. I'm not going to touch conductivity, just so we can watch this lighter blue color, and we can see what happens uh, when we run apply. And we're going to see how it actually affects the graph. Uh, and indeed the data underneath. And that brings them a bit closer together, which is great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there, and we can do a similar thing for conductivity. Now, I mentioned before, uh, those of you who've used SBA data processing a lot, um, 
this process in SBA data processing would be much slower. You'd have to go ahead and first you'd have your converted data file as a CNV, then you'd load that into a line CTD, try one of these settings, and then take that to a separate module, cplot, to actually plot it and see if it looks what you want. Otherwise, you'd have to go back. And if you have other data processing modules that you're running on the data, then those add extra steps along the way too. Uh, like let's say, for example, you wanted derive Teos 10 and you wanted to add some absolute salinity in here, maybe density also. Uh, then you'd have to make sure that you're uh, running that afterwards each time too before you continue. Uh, and it really slows down your process a lot. But with this, you can go ahead and just immediately go and look at your data, see what the changes are, and adjust on the fly. Uh, so this is a great way to both get more familiar with what these different data processing modules are really doing to your data, um, but they're also great for making sure you can really refine and get them to exactly where you want without causing a big headache. Um, now, we did just add uh, salinity and absolute salinity, or absolute salinity and density, excuse me, uh, to our data set. And we can go ahead and look at this tooltip. And this will tell us that we can go ahead and plot derived values after we actually run data processing and include them in here. Uh, it says we can go back to step three of data processing to add them to my plot. Uh, that sounds fun. I'm going to go do that. Let's go ahead and take a step back. Um, and now we're at step three. So uh, according to that tooltip, if I come down here and scroll down, there we go. We've got our salinity, which is absolute salinity. And we've also got our density. So let's go ahead and plot salinity. Uh, I'm tired of looking at this pH graph. Uh, so let's look at salinity instead. Uh, and there we go. That's very exciting. It does look a lot like conductivity, which is sort of what we'd hope uh, from our salinity. Um, and of course, we've got the units here at the top. Um, we can sort of take a look at that. And instead of our auction values, we can go ahead and put our density values into that axis three slot. Um, and we can go ahead and see what density is looking like. Uh, and it's also sort of somewhat similar. Uh, crazy how they all follow a similar curve like that. Um, but now these values are uh, values that we've computed and they're being added to our, our data set. And so when we export our files at the end, uh, we can go ahead and take a look at them. But we're going to do one more thing before we do. We're going to bin our data. Uh, and this is going to make it so that we're actually binning it on uh, whatever size bins we want, really, um, just to sort of reduce uh, how much data is in there. We just get a quick average because we don't care about each individual data point. Uh, I've decided that I just want to know uh, the average at every two decibars. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and hit apply, and we're going to see what that's going to do to our data set. This is going to be the most drastic change we've seen so far. Uh, there we go. Now we've got just a handful of data points in here, uh, and this is showing uh, what exactly we have in our data set averaged at every two decibars. Uh, we can also continue and add buoyancy, for example, if we wanted, but we'll go ahead and leave it there. No, a cat. Sorry, I have cats around here, and they like the camera. Um, now I can go ahead and go next and we can go ahead and actually export all of these data files, uh, as we want, um, and to a number of different formats. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is make sure we're saving to a location that we want it to. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit browse here and make sure I select that demo directory that I showed earlier. There we go. Um, and then now I can go ahead and save out to a number of different file types. I can also have the file name here. I'm going to go ahead and rename this to demo output. Seems like a good name. Now I can save the plot image. Uh, this is as Ryan showed earlier, where this is the image of the plot that we're looking at right now. Uh, sure, let's save that. Why not? I can choose the image height, image width if I wanted. And we've got a number of different options in here as well. So we've got uh, our JSON file, uh, which I'll go more in depth for, but this is very similar to the JSON file that we saw in deployment that Ryan showed off, where this basically saves all the settings and you can preload this in to speed up your workflow a lot. This is uh, essentially replacing what were the PSA files from SVA data processing, uh, which contain all of those settings that you could load in and make sure that you know, you're preloading a workflow. Uh, this is the exact same thing, uh, but for SBS Fathom. And we'll go over in just a moment what that can look like for you. Uh, we've got our CNV file. This is what many of you may be familiar with. Uh, this contains the converted values, and it also includes the instrument metadata as well as the data processing module information for all of the modules that you just ran. Um, so that's great. We've also got the CSV file here. Uh, this is comma separated values. Uh, this is a sort of slim down version of the CNV uh, that you could use if you just care about the data in a CSV format. Uh, we've got the header file, which contains essentially just all of the metadata uh, about the instrument, about the software, about the data processing modules that you just ran. Uh, and then lastly, there's the ASCII file here, the .asc. 
um, and this actually includes some bonus options as well if you select it, uh, where you can choose to exclude some of the scans that were marked bad, for example. Uh, you this is it has a similar format to the CSV and you can choose what separator you want for your columns. If you choose a comma, it really is just the CSV, which is kind of fun. Uh, but you can choose some other options. Like we can have it be a tab in this case. Uh, you can have it include the column names or not. You can have a first column, uh, which has a specific name and value, for example. Uh, you can replace the bad flag with a value of your choosing. So if your processing expects uh, scans that are marked bad to have that be uh, like 77, for example, that you can put that in there and then your processing script will be very happy with you. Um, but we'll go ahead and just leave those all off for now. Uh, and we'll go ahead and hit confirm and we'll save out all of those files. Awesome. Uh, let's go ahead and see, wow, that's a lot of files that we just got there. And it's all the ones that we just expected. Uh, very nice. Um, so we've got our header file, we've got our CSV file, we got our CNV file, our ASC file, PNG and our JSON. Now, it's important to note that when you're on that screen and you're exporting your data, uh, a question that we get pretty often is, well, what do I need? Um, and that really comes down to what you're expecting for your processing. Um, if you're just following something that was a previously defined uh, workflow from SB data processing, you might just need your, C your CNV file because that's what you would typically be getting out of SB data processing in the past. Uh, and so that would be, you know, contingent with your current workflows. Um, but if you, you know, if you need some of these other files, then it's up to you to select what you really want and need. Uh, there's no harm in exporting all of them, even if you're not going to use all of them as well. Um, now let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about this JSON file, this workflow file that I mentioned before. So let's go ahead and get back into here and let's go ahead and uh, load in a hex file again. And we'll go ahead and load in an XML con again. Um, and we'll go ahead and after that, we'll load in one of our workflow files and see uh, what that can look like for us. Um, so uh, there's actually a tooltip here, which will tell you sort of what this is. It's a .json file, and it can be generated after completing data processing, and it contains the selected data processing settings, and loading this will pre-fill the settings into the software. Uh, it can only be used for instruments of the same type. Uh, so if we just went through and run data processing for our 37SM, uh, we're not going to be able to use that JSON file for a 19 plus. We'll start running into some trouble, uh, but that's okay. Uh, we can also generate it via a PSA converter tool, which I'll cover uh, next. So uh, with all that in mind, let's go ahead and choose an option. Um, all of these file loaders will generally filter down to uh, just the file type that uh, we really allow for it. So we're only seeing the JSON file that we just loaded in here. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and cancel loading this for just a second, because what it's going to do is it's going to set all the settings that we had just set before, uh, but those are all still loaded in the software. So we won't get to see the magic. So let's go ahead and put some other different values in here, uh, just so you can make sure that it's actually being run properly. Uh, so now we've set completely different output format. Uh, let's go ahead and load in the JSON, and we see we tick right back over to exactly what we just had before, uh, because all the settings are being loaded. Uh, and this is true not only for the data conversion section, which is what we're looking at here, uh, but it's also true for the data processing section, step four, with all of those modules. Uh, same thing's happening there, where it's loading in all of the settings from the file, uh, not what's was previously in the software. So you can use that to really just define your workflow. You know, you run it through once, you have it perfect, and you can just run that on all of your files if that's really what makes you happy. Uh, so that's a great way to really streamline your workflow and make sure you don't have to come in here and make sure you select which specific checkboxes you want and don't select the ones you don't want uh, and set all those settings individually. If you have a lot of files you're processing, then this is going to really speed up that workflow uh, by quite a bit. Uh, now let's go ahead and cancel. And I've been talking about uh, a number of different tools that we have over the course of this. Uh, and let's go ahead and take a look at what some of those are. So for example, uh, the most recent one that we just saw reference was this convert PSA to data processing workflow JSON file uh, tool that we just uh, had. So this is an alternate way you can go ahead and create those 
uh, data processing workflow JSON files that you can load into data processing. Uh, and this tool is very simple. Uh, it asks for us to load PSA files in. If you don't know what a PSA file is, essentially they are files that are generated as a part of SBA data processing, which capture the entire state for running a specific module in SBA data processing and capture all the settings from it. Um, and now if you're coming to S or coming to SBS Fathom, uh, having come from SBA data processing and you have all these PSA files, you don't want to have to go and try to remember what's in each every one of them. Uh, it'd be nice if there was a tool just to be able to load those in and have the settings uh, get carried over properly. And that's exactly what this tool is. So I've put some PSA files in my demo directory here. These are ones that were generated by SBA data processing, uh, but I can go ahead and load them in directly here. So I have a, uh, a convert one, for example. I'm going to go ahead and load that one in. And it's going to identify, hey, this PSA file was for convert. I can go ahead and have that in there. Very nice. I can go ahead and do that for all of these that I want. I can put in one in for align CTD, for example. Very nice. Uh, and I can go ahead and let's do one for filter. OK, awesome. So we have uh, modules defined for those three. And all of the settings are being going to be saved out to a file. If I didn't like one of these for whatever reason, I decide, I decide, you know what, I don't actually want filter. I could go ahead and hit the clear button and clear it. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that for now, but that's an option. Uh, and it's OK that I don't have any defined for the rest of these modules, because I'm not planning on running those these time. this time. Uh, let's go ahead and hit next. And we can go ahead and save the files out. Let's go ahead and make sure we choose our right directory. Uh, if I was smart at the start of this demo, I would have selected this as my default directory. And I can show you guys where to do that next, uh, but I didn't. Uh, I can save a file name, uh, workflow, why not? Confirm. Uh, and that'll save out workflow. Apparently, I didn't get the W captured there. That's OK. Uh, that's a cool, snazzy name, workflow. Um, now, the last thing I'll show you is that there are a number of these other tools here. Uh, one particularly useful one could be this editing XML con file one. Uh, this would be useful for if you have changed the configuration of your instrument. This is particularly useful for a 19 plus V2. Uh, then you can go ahead and change some of the auxiliary sensors in this tool here. Uh, so for example, if we went from zero to one, well, then we have this auxiliary voltage sensor information. And we'd want to make sure we specify what our auxiliary sensor is. Maybe it's a 43. Put in our calibration coefficients and make sure we can load that into data processing. Um, loading in, you know, typing in all of these calibration coefficients can be a bit of a slug. So you can always load from your active instrument, uh, which will go ahead and put those settings all the way in here. Let's go ahead and press that. Uh, and that'll load. This loaded from my 37 that I have here, and it updated the instrument type as well. Uh, but ultimately, you can load from an XML con uh, and start from you know start from there. So let's look at the one that we had just used in data processing. Uh, and there's a few fields missing because we couldn't find them in XML con that we should probably add. Uh, but then that now that's got all the information uh, that we were just looking at. It's got our dissolved oxygen as well as our pH sensor in there. Cool. Uh, this is great for if you need to create your own XML con. You can go ahead and hit next. Uh, you'll want to fill in some of these missing fields just so we have the most data that we possibly can in that file. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to go look at is what I mentioned before, where you have this default data directory. To get there, I open this ellipses at the very top right, hit settings. Uh, and there's a few settings in here, uh, but the one that I was talking about is this default directory. If you go ahead and hit browse, select your directory, uh, then that's going to be your default file saving directory throughout the application. That'll save you a few clicks here and there. Um, but with that, I think we're getting pretty close to question and answers time. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it back over to Nicole. Hopefully, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, but feel free to put whatever questions in there, and we'll try to get to them as best as we can. One other, other thing that I'd like to just talk a little bit about, um, all of our data processing, we also have a GitHub repository of Python code that duplicates all of our code. So let's say you have you know hundreds and thousands of files to process. You could write a script uh, using our new Python library uh, to automate this whole process. Um, on top of that, you can also see in that code the exact formulas and exact calculations of what's going on behind the scenes here. Uh, it's really laid out as like our documentation for data processing. So you can really get into the weeds of the actual math behind uh, all of this process. Yeah, and one of our team members, Bruce, is going to be uh, leading one of these sessions on this upcoming Thursday. So if you're interested in that, uh, keep an eye out for that.
Great. Well, thank you, Dane and Ryan. Um, it looks like we had several questions that Ryan answered and should be visible to attendees now uh, for the written answers. And then we have one from Luis saying, looks like he's struggling with downloading the data from an SB19 plus and the app is going black. Uh, sounds like the app is not functioning properly. Any insight into that? Uh, that's something that hopefully tech support would be able to help out with. Um, in this case, it, if possible, it might not be, but it's always useful to try to capture uh, any terminal output that you have um, as a part of your session. Um, if your app is completely going black and you're not able to access the terminal after trying a data upload, then I understand that that might not be possible. But uh, that's something to reach out to tech support about because we don't necessarily know uh, what is going on with your specific instrument. Um, but hopefully they're able to help get that resolved. And I just put the tech support email as an answer to that question. So you should have that there. Any other questions? Francisco is asking, is the nine plus supported for processing? The nine plus is not currently supported for processing. Uh, the the instruments that we're currently supporting are the SB19 Plus V2, the 37SM, and a variety of other 37s, like the SMP, SMP, ODO, et cetera, uh, as well as the 39 Plus uh, is just recently added to the application. Um, everything else uh, we're planning on adding at some point in time. Uh, we're just focusing on uh, one or two new instruments at a time, and hopefully we'll get there. Um, and then Stephanie is asking, will the 19 plus V1 be supported in the future? We're not currently planning on supporting the 19 plus V1. We're generally uh, hoping that users will be able to upgrade to the V2. Um, if there's a huge demand for it, then you can feel free to, to reach out to our tech support and let them know. Uh, and maybe that decision can get changed. But currently, that's not uh, something that we're planning on adding anytime soon. Great. We have someone asking about getting the temp files, please, in a JSON, CSV, and bin formats. Where would they get them? Uh, could you repeat the question, Nicole? Yeah, so the question is, where did I get those temp files, like JSON, CSV, and bin formats? Uh, yeah, so a lot of those files um, that I showed, I've got, I've opened up my directory here again. Uh, a lot of them came from the end of the process and plot data step. Uh, so that's where I got, for example, my CSV file from. That's where I got my CNV file from, was in selecting those options at the very last step of this process and plot data. Uh, that's where you can choose how you want all of your converted data to show up there. Um, the files that we loaded into the data processing uh, were the hex file and the XMLCon file. Uh, the hex file came from our save instrument data to computer, uh, where that's uploading the data from our instrument onto the computer. Uh, and then the XMLCon, I had it already saved, um, but those might be given to you by Seabird with when you get your instrument to begin with or when a calibration is done on it, um, or they could be created via that XMLCon editor tool uh, that I mentioned just recently, uh, where you can actually load load those in. Um, I don't think I showed a .bin file format, um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question completely, uh, but hopefully it does. Great. And then we have a three-part question. How does one mark scans as bad again? Is that an all-manual process? And how does that flag show in the output files? Yeah, great question. Um, so that's actually, it's not a manual process. Uh, there is, I'm going to go ahead and quickly step through data processing here while I am answering your question. Uh, but there are a couple of these data processing modules that will go ahead and actually uh, do that marking of bad scans for you, essentially. Uh, so let's continue onwards here. I'm just going to run with whatever default settings we've got. Uh, a few of the modules, what they do is they look for different sort of discrepancies or uh, potential issues with your data set, and they'll go ahead and mark scans bad. So uh, an example of that is, I believe, wild edit here. Uh, yeah, it'll tell us that it marks scans bad if they're outside uh, the standard deviations that follow. So uh, if we go ahead and run those, then 
uh, it'll potentially look for some of the data, data that is outside of uh, where we'd expect it, and it'll mark some bad. Uh, I'm going to turn off bin average uh, because that's going to make it so that those don't really get shown very well. Uh, so we go ahead and hit apply. Uh, I'm not sure if the default settings for this file will really mark any that are bad. It looks like a few data points got sort of uh, taken out there. So let's go ahead and go next. Um, and we can go ahead and make sure that we don't uh, overwrite any data. Let's go ahead and hit confirm, put a dash two on there. And we can go ahead and really quickly look at one of those data sets to see what they look like. Um, let's see. Let's look at our CNV file real quick. OK. Uh, now we want to look to see when they're marked bad. Uh, and that's when we'll see this value. This is what the default value is uh, in the Fathom software is this negative 9.99 E negative 29. It's just the value that you're never going to see that for a legitimate value. Uh, so this will let you know that this these scans were marked bad. And these top few scans here uh, are were likely marked bad because they were a part of when the instrument may have been on the deck of uh, the ship that was being used for this, or potentially uh, just before when they're in the air getting lowered down to the water. Uh, so it makes sense that they were marked bad. If we scroll down, we can continue looking to see if any were marked bad. It looks like some at the end were probably for a similar cause. Um, specifically, we'll notice that um, we can look a little bit more sort of what the format in here is. Uh, we have our columns. This is showing what, what each column of data uh, represents. Uh, and we have a lot of columns, so uh, don't get too overwhelmed. Um, but this very last column at the L at the end is our flag values. Um, and so generally, some of the modules will only flag uh, like an individual data point itself. Um, and so it might just put the flag in that flag column. Um, in this case, it applied it to the whole row. Uh, but uh, down the line, it might just apply it to just the flag column, which is this very last one. Uh, and that's what you'd sort of look to see. Um, and again, in that uh, in that ASCII file options, there is an option to replace the bad value with something else um, if you want it to show something else for this that makes more sense to you, then that's an option for you. Great. Um, another question uh, about the SBE 37, which do not have the binary option. Can the app handle these as well as starting from ASCII? Uh, yeah. yeah so, oh, go ahead, Ryan. And I got to uh, hear up on my screen if you want to switch over. Oh, sure. Yeah. Let me go ahead and stop my share. Um, yeah. Here on uh, the data upload panel, you do have the option of switching between both the binary format and the ASCII format. Uh, so it's possible that it'll work well for the older 37s that only have that one format. Uh, we are currently only supporting uh, the most current versions of the firmware uh, of all these instruments. So uh, although a lot of the older instruments might work, uh, they're not completely uh, supported. So there's no guarantee there yet, uh, but that's coming soon. All right. And another question from Stephanie. Does this new software allow for processing multiple casts at once, like SBE processing software allowed? Or is it limited to one file at a time? Yeah, we currently uh, don't have uh, what's you know kind of known as like batch processing, uh, but it is a feature that we're planning on adding. So that will be in an upcoming uh, version soon. Great. Looks like that may be all of the questions we have. Um, thank you to everyone for attending. You will get a follow-up email after this that includes a couple of surveys. One is to provide feedback on the sessions you've attended, and another is to give us any suggestions for other courses, other topics you might be interested in learning about through SBU. Um, so please do take a couple of minutes to fill those out. We really value your feedback, and that's what helps us make better presentations in the future and, and decide what we should share with you. So Really appreciate everyone joining. Um, you can also always reach out if you have any other questions. Um, and this will be recorded and posted onto our YouTube channel in the next week or so, I would say. So if you ever wanna go back and take a look at, at what you learned today, you can definitely do that. And with that, I think we will end it and give everyone a couple of minutes back. Thanks everyone for joining and thanks Ryan and Dane. Thanks everyone, have a great day.